Take a journey on the Silk Road, Marco Polo's ancient route to China. Produced at a cost of $50 million and requiring over 10 years to produce, the Silk Road video collection is comprised of separate adventures linking ancient and modern day Asia. Broadcast to outstanding critical acclaim in over 25 countries, the Silk Road is now available on video for the first time. With the entrancing music of Guitaro as a backdrop, each of the episodes in the collection focuses on the history, art, and culture of one of the world's most inaccessible regions. A raging sandstorm from the Taklamakan Desert blew across the road ahead of the Sino-Japanese expedition. After we had left Lo Lan, we set out in a southwesterly direction along the southern route to the western lands. This is one of the oldest parts of the Silk Road, and it was once very prosperous. One hundred and seventy kilometers or a hundred miles from the kingdom of Lo Lan, we reached the ruins of the ancient Buddhist city of Miran. We could see an old earthwork through the sandstorm, which was getting worse. The tower of Miran was being seen by foreign eyes for the first time since it was rediscovered by the British explorer Oral Stein at the beginning of the 20th century. Here, Stein had found beautiful products of the mixing of two civilizations. This mural painting is of an angel with wings. It's a bit like a Western seraph, but the hair with only one lock on the left-hand side shows an Eastern influence. Here, the big nose and thick hair makes the picture look like an image of Jesus Christ, but it's actually Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha. 
Hellenistic and Buddhist cultures were combined here to produce a strange new kind of beauty. This castle was built of big sun-dried bricks in a square, about 70 meters or 200 feet to the side. It was a fort built by the Tibetan people who came here from the south in the 8th century. The Tibetans disappeared during the 11th century, and since that time, Miran has been buried under the desert sand. However, they still sing an old song called Kala Bran, the song of the black storm. It tells how the sandstorms buried the city that was once their home. The Kunlun Mountains are covered with permanent snow, and this southern route to the western lands marks the boundary between the Kunlun Mountains to the south and the Taklamakan Desert to the north. In the last part of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th, many expeditions from all parts of the world came here. The last was the British expedition led by Stein, which came in 1914. We were the first foreigners to come here for 65 years. Four hundred kilometers or 240 miles west of Miran is the Jiuqian River, which has its source in the melting snows of the Kunlun Mountains. And on the west bank of the river lies the oasis town of Jiuqian. One of the few oasis towns to be found along this southern route, Jiuqiang is quite big. It has a population of 35,000, of which 85% are Uyghurs. 
This was the first time for us to see Uyghurs. They have big noses and well-marked features, and they're obviously different from any of the other people we'd met so far on the Silk Road. To the Japanese, they seem quite Western-looking. This is the main street of Jiuchang town, with all sorts of stalls on either side. The Uyghurs, who are of Turkic stock, first came to this area in the 9th century. Today they've settled around the Taklamakan Desert, and they're the principal inhabitants of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. They're a cheerful folk who have their own kind of music, their own language, and even their own script. The expedition was warmly welcomed by the children of the Jiuchang First Elementary School. This school is only for Uyghurs, the town's majority inhabitants, and it has 500 pupils. More than there are at the Chinese school, which is called the Second Elementary School. In the lower classes, they learn in the Uyghur language, but they start to learn Chinese in the fourth grade. The children gave a hearty welcome to the first foreigners most of them had ever seen. Uyghur people are very fond of singing and dancing. In fact, whatever their age, whenever they get together, they start to sing and dance. This is a nomadic song that they still sing in memory of the old days. But even today, you can still find a special corporation in Jiuqiang for nomadic herdsmen. The oasis is fed by the Jiuqiang River. After the revolution, new irrigation canals were built, increasing the amount of arable land. We talked to one of the Uyghur farmers, whose name was Mai Mai Tohoti. Yes, this is a good place to live. There's plenty of water and farmland, and the harvests are good. You can grow almost anything here. Wheat, corn, oats, grapes, peaches, oranges, watermelons, pears. 
Ziyaf binasını şunda terip maylak pucak, pucakım ba. Zağun. Zağun. Hem mesela terip bizim ziyaf binası da terip binası falan cidden bizim ba tak ya. Cidden. Öksel öksel. Öksel. The people's houses are made of mud bricks, and in the summertime they often eat in the open air under the grapevines. <laughs> There are 11 people in the family, including the eldest son and his children. Altogether, there are five adult workers, and their salary is 1,300 yuan per year. But they also sell the grapes and vegetables they grow, so their total income comes to 2,700 yuan, about 1,720 US dollars a year. <laughs> But they have their own goats for meat, and they grow most of their other food, so they're comparatively rich. Mr. Mai Mai Tohoti said his family could be considered middle class in Jiuqiang. <laughs> The staple food of the Uyghurs is a kind of bread called nang. It's made of wheat flour kneaded out flat and round and baked in a simple oven. Five or six neighbours get together and chat as they bake a week's supply of nun, several hundred flat cakes. They needn't worry it'll go mouldy, it's quite dry when it's baked and the relative humidity never rises above 40%. Three hundred and sixty kilometers or two hundred miles west of Jiuqiang is the town of Mingfeng. Using this town as a base, the expedition set out to find the ruins of Niya. To reach Niya, you go 110 kilometers or 70 miles north along the Niya River into the Taklamakan Desert. In the Uyghur language, Taklamakan means the place from which nothing living returns. But we none of us expected the great difficulties we found here. Here, there was a wood of dead willow trees that seemed like a graveyard.
In the dead forest, we found a herd of camels. Now we are in the desert, the roads became much rougher and we could no longer use the low-slung jeeps. We had to transfer all our equipment into trucks and the team had to ride in the open vehicles in the hot sun. to travel the 88 kilometers or 50 miles from Mingfang. Hours to travel the 88 kilometers or 50 miles from Mingfang. We divided the journey into two stages, the first by truck along the Niya River as far as Damazar, the second by camel for the remaining 30 kilometers or 18 miles to Niya, one day's journey. The landmark we were making for was a giant stupa the remains of a Buddhist pagoda in the middle of the ruins. We plan to explore the ruins from this tower for a couple of days and to return to Dharmaza on the morning of the fifth day. We set up camp in the middle of the desert. The caravan was made up of 58 camels and 29 people, including 10 from the expedition, a doctor, wireless operator and a local guide. We were carrying more than four tons of provisions with us of which more than half, two and a half tons, in fact, was water. We brought as few cameras and as little food and equipment as possible. One camel should be able to carry more than 150 kilograms or 300 pounds but there are always a few that refuse to budge with such a heavy load. And since we'd been forced to take them from four different villages, several were already skittish and nervous. Our original plan was to set out on the second day at nine in the evening, but we were not yet ready by noon next day. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
We unexpectedly met a very old man who told us he had guided Stein to the Nia ruins in 1906, more than 70 years ago. Hello, I'm now 92 years old. I remember we found an old pot with a lot of red papers inside it. It must have been written documents. I know it was very cold at the time we found them. I didn't like it too much. After another five hours delay, we finally set out from Dharmazar. Here, the Nia River now disappears into the sand, although in the past it used to flow all the way to the ruins. They're actually quite close, if only you could travel directly towards them. But an old riverbed lies that way, a deep sandy valley with dead trees across it. That sort of terrain is too tiring for camels. So, avoiding the valley route, we went westwards into the desert and then turned north when we reached a comparatively flat place. It was very hot. The air temperature was more than 33 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And the ground temperature was over 50 degrees Celsius, 120 degrees Fahrenheit. If we could find the Nia ruins, we should be the first foreigners to see them for about 70 years. If you travel a long way by camel, the leader keeps their speed to about three kilometers or two miles an hour. On the day we started out late, we only had about five kilometers or three miles to go to the ruins when the sun set. So we gave up for the day and made camp, as the Uyghur caravan master thought it would be too dangerous to travel by night. The next morning, we started out at nine o'clock because we thought it would be only an hour or so before we got to the ruins. It was very hot, and even at that early hour of the morning, it was already almost 30 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit.
However, after an hour, there was no sign of the ruins, nor could we see anything by noon. We kept on after a quick lunch without the usual rest every two hours. Our canteens, which we were sharing out by the cupful, were quickly running dry. Still, we could see nothing but the empty desert. Now we've been traveling for nine hours and there was still nothing but empty desert. The temperature was more than 40 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And we no longer had any idea where we were. We were lost and very tired. We held a hasty conference in the usual mixture of three languages, Japanese, Chinese and Uyghur. But we could only conclude that we must somehow have missed the ruins. Night fell before we could establish our position. We sent a radio message to the emergency base at Ming Fang and the guides divided themselves into three groups which would scout round and try to find the ruins. That night we kept a fire burning to mark our position so that the patrols could find us again. It was rather a frightening time However, one scouting party brought good news. We'd pass north of the ruins without knowing it. Moving in a southwesterly direction, they had soon found Nia. But it was only on the fourth day after leaving Minfang that we finally arrived. The stupa, or Buddhist tower, was six meters high or 18 feet, built of sun-dried bricks and showed evidence of having been plundered by robbers. The Niya ruins cover an area 20 kilometers or 12 miles north to south by 10 kilometers or six miles east to west, centered at this stupa. We had already wasted a whole day, so the cameramen concentrated on four groups of ruins nearest the stupa. 
we made a start at one of these that lay about 1.5 kilometers or a mile northwest of the stupa. There were large wooden frames that looked like the remains of enormous rooms. Measuring, we found that each was about 8 meters square or 25 feet. When we compared what we were looking at with Stein's diagrams, we realized we were in the group of ruins he had called N1. About one kilometer or half a mile further northwest was another group Stein called N2. One big building had perhaps been some sort of city hall, and it had a smaller house next to it with an enclosure for goats. People of many different occupations, officials, farmers and others, had all lived together here. We had the uneasy feeling that, even after more than a dozen centuries, the real owners might suddenly appear again. Beginning with Stein, explorers from many parts of the world have excavated here to try to find out more about the lives of the people of Niya. This beautiful chair is carved with designs typical of the Western land style. This tiny Buddhist image is small enough to hold in your hand. You can find traces of Buddhism everywhere. Documents found here, in an ancient Indian language written in Karoshti characters, have thrown some light on the old kingdom of Lolan. The king, who was really a sort of emperor, was the ultimate ruler whose representatives could be found at many of the oases of the kingdom. It's clear there must have been a well-developed central administrative system. About three kilometers or two miles south of the stupa, there was a great house which belonged to the local chief, who was appointed by the king of Lo Lan and who was called Choboji. The Choboji must have been a very busy man. We know he had to collect the taxes and administer the region, to supervise the passage of travelers along the Silk Road, to witness the adoption of children, and to act as a sort of marriage counselor. Many people must have come to his great house, which was more like a small palace. It occupied an area of about 700 square meters or 7,000 square feet, and had a huge reception room, more than 70 square meters or 700 square feet in size, strongly built with solid pillars. Stein said that the houses of Nia were well built and that they were very large.
Originally, there was an avenue with trees on either side going westwards from the chief's house, though almost every trace of it has now disappeared. Near the stupa, we found bones, whitened by years of exposure. Beneath these vast ruins, many secrets must still lie buried. Here are the mummies of a man and his wife, found in one of the graves in the Nia ruins. Apparently, the woman committed suicide when her husband died, a ritual the Indians call sati. Their hands are clasped together, and on one hand we can see a ring. We can almost read a story of a great love, like that of the woman in Lo Lan with the heron feathers in her hair. Around the body of the man was wrapped a silk robe that bore four Chinese characters, a prayer for eternal bliss. These people were of some western race, for they had big noses unlike most eastern people. But in their lives, they only knew Chinese culture. Their pillow is in the shape of a pheasant, a common good luck symbol among the Chinese. and their combs and cosmetics basket were made from the wood of the wisteria tree, a typically Chinese material. But many of the objects found here were more typical of the Western lands, the Silk Road culture that was a mixture of East and West. The famous sino karoshti coins were in use in Nia. They had Chinese characters on one side and Karoshti writing on the other. Then suddenly, in the middle of the 4th century AD, Nia disappears from view. Nothing is known about its collapse. Perhaps as the Nia River gradually dried up and the desert advanced, the people had to trek south to find the necessities of life. Drought must have forced them to leave the country they'd inhabited for so long and to move away in search of water. On the evening of the second day at the ruins, the weather suddenly changed. It started with a few tiny whirlwinds, and then the wind rose and made the sand dance.
The camels were now very tired. They'd endured many days with an air temperature of over 40 degrees Celsius, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and a ground temperature of almost 50 degrees Celsius, 120 degrees Fahrenheit. They'd reached the limit of their endurance and began noisily to call for water. We gave them most of what we had left. And now the long stay in the desert had exhausted us too. So we changed our plans. The caravan master decided it was a time to ignore the danger of night travel. We'd leave Nia at midnight. He warned us, but don't fall asleep. Anyone who falls off his camel will be left behind. The Nia ruins disappeared rapidly into the darkness of the moonless desert night. Take a journey on the Silk Road, Marco Polo's ancient route to China, produced at a cost of $50 million and requiring over 10 years to produce. The Silk Road video collection is comprised of separate adventures linking ancient and modern day Asia. Broadcast to outstanding critical acclaim in over 25 countries, the Silk Road is now available on video for the first time with the entrancing music of Guitaro as a backdrop. Each of the episodes in the collection focuses on the history, art, and culture of one of the world's most inaccessible regions. In the glories of ancient Chang'an, you'll visit the starting point of the Silk Road, Chang'an, the world's largest city in the 7th century. You'll see the incredible clay army, buried for almost 2,000 years. The discovery of these 6,000 statues was an archaeological triumph, and the Silk Road crew were the first foreigners allowed to photograph it. Thrill at the sculptures deep in the world's largest tomb, and then enter China's most hallowed Buddhist temple. Examine the hidden underground murals of a legendary princess, and walk the only man-made object visible from outer space, the Great Wall of China. In a thousand kilometers beyond the Yellow River, you'll cross the Yellow River in a goatskin raft, gaze in awe at the same giant Buddha that Marco Polo saw 700 years ago. Look with amazement at the huge water wheels that irrigate miles of Chinese croplands, and visit the secret caves of Bingli Sea, never before photographed by a television crew. Then, transverse the forbidden corridor between the mountains and the Gobi Desert, where the Huns battled the Chinese for control over the most prized horses in the world. In the art gallery in the desert, you'll tour the legendary Magao Caves at Dunhuang, over 500 caves filled with more than 3,000 murals and statues, dating back to the 4th century AD, an oasis of history located in the middle of the Gobi Desert. These incredible man-made caves are an architectural masterpiece and the dream of art scholars around the world. Now, you will be among the first Westerners to visit them, and you'll see for yourself 
why these artifacts are considered to be among the most priceless treasures on Earth. In the Dark Castle, you'll encounter a mysterious ghost castle situated in the Gobi Desert. These ruins are all that remain after Genghis Khan obliterated the legendary city of Karakoto and exterminated the people that built it. After the Russian explorer Kozlov unearthed the castle, he took its incomparable treasures to the Russian art museum, the Hermitage. The castle, believed by the Chinese to be cursed, has not been entered for over 50 years until now. The castle stands near the Russian-Chinese border and is in a sensitive military zone normally closed to anyone but the Chinese army. You can only visit this region today via the Silk Road. The journey continues in search of the lost kingdom of Lulan, where you'll discover a lost kingdom which vanished into the sands of the desert. Join the first journey in half a century to seek these ruins. You'll uncover Silk Road relics that have been buried for over a millennium, and you'll unearth a mummy that's been preserved in a secret grave for over 2,000 years. The wind-carved rocks of the desert surround you at every turn. You'll gaze in amazement at the beauty that has taken nature and eternity to create. In across the Taklamakan Desert, you'll be the first foreign visitors in over 75 years to visit the ancient Buddhist city of Muran. Visit the beautiful home of a Chinese farmer and his family, and the gardens and vineyards that surround their land. Meet nomads in an oasis town, and be delighted as the village children sing and dance for you. You'll then attempt to cross the desert described by the locals as the place from which nothing living returns. After losing your way in the 120 degree heat, your caravan will stumble into ancient ruins and then attempt a night escape across the desert to safety. The Silk Road is an opportunity to travel through Asia as never before possible. Experience a voyage into the past by visiting the present. Examine the art, thrill to the scenery, and enjoy the hospitality of the people of these far-off regions. Your copy of The Silk Road will be your passport to an unforgettable journey.